So it's Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 through chapter 12, verse 14. Okay, last week we talked about what we see versus what we do not see. Visible, everyone sees it. Whether you are a believer or not, it doesn't really matter. And a lot of times that's the end of the story. Because all you see is what everybody else sees. And that's all you're looking for, all you're striving for. Then, again, a lot of philosophers looked at life that way. And they didn't see any meaning in life. So we're not like that. We see the things that other people see, but we also see invisible things with spiritual heart, spiritual eyes. So believers, as believers, we see both ends. What we see, what other people don't see. All right. So the Bible says that we are wise, the people with wisdom, because we see something that the world does not see. For today's passage, I want to focus on the biblical worship and community of worship. And this theme will repeat again and again throughout the Deuteronomy and throughout the entire Bible. So whenever we see the passage with that subject, we'll go over that together. First, verse 26 through 28, as we read earlier, two different options. One's for blessing, the other one is the curse. So Moses' sermon, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, this entire book, Deuteronomy, is mainly a three sermons by Moses. And this particular sermon in today's passage He's telling us, guys, we have two choices. Bible is always giving us the entire picture. It's not always, okay, you're going to be okay, whatever you do. Bible doesn't say that. It gives us the complete picture. It's not in between. Okay, I'm going to be in between these two and sitting on the fence and I'm not going to decide anything. You cannot do that either. A lot of things in this world, yes, you can. You don't have to make a clear decision on something. But the direction in this matter, spiritual matter, you cannot be in the middle and then not going anywhere. All right. So either either the blessing or the curse that these are the options we have. So the place that in, in question here is are two different mountains, Mount Grism and the other one is Ebal. So those are actually in Shechem. Shechem is the, the place here. And that's the one that, if you look at Genesis chapter 12, that's where Abraham, before he changed his name, Abram, he first built the altar there. So this one has a lot of history, a lot of memories of those Israelites from the beginning. So when you go there, as you can see, this, this is Jordan River. So when you go there in that area, you're going to see two different mountains. One's there and the other one's here. And about blessing and curse, we are going to revisit that in Deuteronomy chapter 27. For today, though, we want to remember that God is merciful. He's patient for us. If this is his time today, right away, he can make a decision. You are going to be blessed. You are going to be cursed. That's it. No more. But now God is still speaking through these preachers and teachers today in this world. Guys, there's a way for blessing, another way for the curse. Which way would you choose? God is telling us to make the right decision. So this is how it starts at chapter 12, the statutes and rules. And these are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do. So what happens is this. This is the kind of uh, preamble or the introduction about what you're supposed to be doing. Look at this Israelites. They were in Egypt as slaves. That's not when God gave them the commandments. They're slaves. Now they're saved. They're going into the promised land. In between those two, that's when God gave them the, the direction to follow. Same thing. If we look at our spiritual life, before we believed in Christ, we don't need to follow the Bible. We don't care about the Bible if you don't believe in God. But now you are in church and you are proclaiming that I'm a Christian. Then this is 
the things that you need to be careful to do for the rest of your life. And God says, if you do that, you will be blessed. Let's say you went and entered uh, the college and or you got a new job. There's rules to follow. There is a requirement, classes to finish to graduate from college. Same thing for work. You have to come and work 40 hours a week. This is what happens. There's rules to follow. There's expectations in any settings though. I think I shared this story with a Korean congregation a long time ago. When Sunday comes and this person didn't want to go to church. So his mother came to the room. Hey, time to go to church. He said, no, I want to stay at home. Why? I don't feel good. But you can't do that. Why not? Because you're the head pastor. You got to deliver the message. Same thing. As a pastor, you cannot say, I want to skip Sunday today. No, you can't do that. There's expectation that you're supposed to prepare your sermon all week long and deliver the service or sermon on Sunday. Let's compare these two different worlds. First one is the world, the secular world that people follow, with that we used to follow, that we used to live in. And those are unbelievers. We are believers. The difference is this. They have their own religion in this world. And it says we have a lot of different philosophies, psychology, motivation, speech, everywhere. But the difference between unbelievers and believers is we are following the word of God, the word of life. Statutes and rules that we're supposed to follow. Yeah, we know what's going on in this world, but our rules and, and statutes based on the Bible, that's what we follow. That's the difference. So biblical worship is supposed to happen this way. And when you read this passage, God is asking them to destroy everything that the Gentiles practice. They have a lot of different places for worship, a lot of images, a lot of inscriptions in different places. Get rid of them. In today's term, more relevant thing for us to do is getting rid of our worldly habits, the things that, that we used to enjoy as unbelievers. That does not mean we all gonna be holy, we don't even smile or laugh, and always serious, that's not what I'm saying. God made this universe, you were supposed to enjoy it, but that doesn't mean you're gonna be immoral, for example. So what we see and hear in this world, just Put it down, get rid of it as much as you can. That's what we call sanctification process. We're getting better every day. If I wanna to go to uh, Olympic games, for example, four years from now, then I'm gonna practice in a certain sport. Let's say I'm a gymnast. If I don't get better every day for the next four years, if I still do like a little hop, yeah, that's all I do every day for four years. I don't think I'm going to make it to the Olympic teams. What do you think? The same thing. We're living in this life and we're not getting any better for anything and hoping something will happen to us. It's not going to happen that way. And I have to work 40 hours a week to earn my salary, wage. And getting into the Word of God and learn more about it and practice more and get better to become a Christian even. So first element of true worship is the Word of God. We have to have that. Unfortunately, the state of the church in America. This book was published back in 2008. Michael Horton is a Calvinist, very conservative theologian. And most likely he's, I think he's Presbyterian. But he said this, Christless Christianity, that, that's the title of the book. If you look at the picture in the middle, it's blank there. The Last Supper, Jesus is missing there. Yep. Can you believe that? What happened was this. He said he went to this church, prominent church. One of his relatives and family members attended this church. So he went there. He was visiting them. 
And that church, since he was so, it was famous church, he went through a lot of different meetings, like youth group gatherings, main service, after the service, Bible study and different things. He attended those meetings and see, wow, this church must be really good. What he found out was every single meetings there, he couldn't find Christ. They didn't care about the word of God too much. They put it on the wall. We love Jesus. But what they do in the room had nothing to do with Christ. That's why he wrote this book 13 years ago. Did it get better in America? I don't think so. The subtitle is there, The Alternative Gospel of the American Church. Alternative Gospel. In Galatians, Paul said, nope, there's no alternative. There's no other gospel, guys. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Based on the word of God, that's the true gospel, whatever you preach and teach and learn. Everything else, it's not the gospel. And what happened in Galatian church is they were following other practices. Legalism. Okay, we got to do this A, B, C, D to become a Christian. Like add X, Y, Z, then I'm going to be sanctified. It doesn't make any sense. So Paul said, no, you cannot do that. Whatever I taught you based on the word of God, that's the only gospel. There's no other gospel. And this book tells us that people are looking for something other than the Bible. Even at church. Is Bible always exciting to read? I would say not really. Let me share my story. The fact that I read the Bible every day, the reason is this. The fact that I am getting into the presence of God, not that He is missing in action, and true Word of God, I'm going there and encountering Him with His Word, and He's telling me through this Word of God, and actually I'm getting to know Him better. That's more exciting than actual content itself sometimes. Mount Grism and Mount Ebal, I'm not really excited about their locations. I look for their pictures too, but I'm not really excited about it. I'm excited about God told Moses to talk to Israelites. Okay, I want to be there. I want to hear the voice of Moses. I wish. But it's recorded here. So I can kind of picture myself, imagine myself being there, listening to Moses coming from the Lord. It's amazing. That's what makes me excited about reading the Bible. Right? Some details, content, not always. But once you get excited about getting into the Word of God, then those details will come alive and work in your heart. That's why just like you go on every day. If you have a chance, if you want to read this book with me, let me know. It's, it's one of those books that I enjoy reading it. I said, wow. This guy is describing the church, today's church, so accurately. Back then, I was in a different church. And this book is one of the main reasons I thought about, do we have Christ in our church? It made me think about that. Biblical worship. Let's go on. And he said, you shall not worship your Lord, your God, this way, like other Gentiles. But you have to do this. Right? You have to find a place where his name will be there. But it's not about actual place, geographical place, or his name. It's more about his sovereignty, his divine authority over us. Because when he says geographical place, guess what? In the Old Testament, they're always referring to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the one place they have to go worship God at least three times a year. But in this situation, where were they? Ready to get into the promised land. They didn't really build Jerusalem yet. Timing-wise, it doesn't work. 
It's not referring to Jerusalem yet. The temple was built by Solomon. So we have a long way to go. So it's not about the place. It's about his authority. If you look at the entire passage and the context, the reason why he mentioned about name is other gods' names were in those places, high places, that he asked them to destroy. First one was the word of God you have to have, and people who acknowledge the divine authority are the people of God. Saints. We are the saints. The biblical worship has to take place in that sense. And as we all know in John, the Samaritan woman asked Jesus, where should we worship? The mountain that our ancestor is talking about, which mountain was it? Mount Grism, one of those mountains, or Jerusalem? And Jesus said, no, neither. And you got to bring your burnt offerings and list of these offerings are here. That does not mean you have to go out and next time come back to church with your dead animals. And No, that's not what it means. But your offerings, when you bring to church, why do you bring that to church? When people were worshiping Baal, what happened was they brought those sacrifices, which is very similar to the Israelites, in exchange of the blessing from the Gentile God. Since the Gentile God was in charge of weather and fertility, so they're saying, okay, I'm going to give you this, and you're going to give me more. It's not even an even exchange. I'm going to give you one, you bless me with five. Thank you. That's why I'm here. But a lot of church goers do the same thing. Since I'm going to chip in $10 to my church, God will bless me with $100. Aha! Uh -huh. A great deal. It doesn't work that way. If that was the case, if you look at the biblical uh, people, especially those apostles, and look at Apostle Paul, they're kind of poor. Yeah, not that they didn't know about this business deal that we know. No, it never works that way. But somehow today's church is teaching that way. I don't know how and why. There's some passages you may misinterpret and tweak it and use it that way. But if you look at the entire Bible, it's not like that. So why do we bring our offerings? Whatever you call it, you can call it tithing, you can call it peace offering in different ways. But the bottom line is it's all about the offerings of thanksgiving. You're thanking God, and that's it. If you thank somebody, you may give some gift to that person. Not because you want to get something from that person. Just thanking that person, right? By the way, the coffee was really good. Thank you. Yeah. That's how we're supposed to be. When you come to church, you're supposed to offer because you are appreciative about God's salvation. If you truly believe that you're saved, if you truly believe that these believers are around you, that the fellowship is so worthwhile, then you've got to be thankful for everything. Proverbs 3 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. When you have important guests higher up with a lot of power, and that person came to your house, you're not going to give him or her the leftover from your dinner two nights ago. Would you? No. We had to honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Something valuable. It's not about the amount, right? And I'm going to talk about that more in chapter 14 because we are going to deal with tithing there. But a little spoiler here, uh, it's not about the amount. It's not about 10%. It's about your heart. If you can joyfully give, that's the right amount. Again, a lot of churches in this world asking church members to get a debt to submit their tithing. 
That's just so wrong. Why do you be, why do you have to be pressured to come to the Lord? Right? I don't have money to bring this. No. If you don't have anything, don't don't worry about it. Just come to church and listen to the the word of God. You're here as God's children to rejoice together. I'm going to show it to you later. Don't be pressured for anything, including your offerings. All right? So first was word of God. Second was the people who are acknowledging the divine authority of God, God's people. Third one is offering of thanksgiving. This, those are the elements of community of uh, the worship, true worship. And the fourth element is the fellowship of the saints. You're supposed to eat together. And we're supposed to rejoice together. And please note, it says, before the Lord your God, and you're supposed to rejoice. I don't know how many of you, as you grow up, when you're young, of course, when you're young, very young, and you start singing in front of your parents, right, dancing, and your parents say, hey, good job. We're going to look at them. They're not a good singer. They don't really dance well, but they just love them. Yay! And they just rejoice together. You had no worries. You're just happy because your parents are happy. Your parents are happy because you guys are happy. They're happy together. It's a good time, right? Before the Lord your God, we're supposed to have that mindset. We're supposed to have rejoice in our heart because we're coming to the presence of the Lord. He's everywhere, but still, it's a special place that we're getting together and worshiping together. And how can you not rejoice in it? When you truly love the Lord, when you know the Lord is holding you, protecting you, He loves you, He is enjoying with you whatever you do, even though we're not perfect. It's not about you doing better than other people. Offering more than other people, you know, come to church more than anybody else. No, it's about your mindset. Then you will do the right thing. That's all that is. Some people have five talents. Some people have two. Some people have only one. Based on our assessment, some people have more than the other. That's what we see. But what did God say? You're faithful for small things. He said the same thing to both five-talent guy and two-talent guy. The way we see there's a difference, God does not see the difference. It's all about your heart. Okay? No pressure, no stress. Again, why do you want to get stressed to come to church? No, you shouldn't. So the fellowship, when and where can we do that? Because of pandemic, we cannot really do much, you know, fellowship at church. Korean side, same thing. Every Sunday, once a week. Can we eat once a week and survive? It says, you shall eat and rejoice. So, so we're going to have a fellowship with our saints once a week. I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think I can function just eating one meal in seven days. So we have to revisit the definition of you and your household. If you have family members in you, in your household, husband and wife or children, parents, how often do you talk to each other or have interaction with each other? Every week, once a week, just like Jerusalem uh, worship three times a year? No. You just constantly bump into each other, talk to each other, have dinner together, whatever have you, right? So you have to do that all the time. So it's interesting because Bible says Moses was talking to the entire Israelites and he uses the expression, you and your households. We have to revisit the definition of actual our family. It is important. Looking after your family is very important. And everybody with a bright mind is supposed to 
do that. Whether you're a believer or not, it doesn't really matter. So we have to go, again, visible, invisible. We have to go above and beyond our blood relationship. Jesus defined it in a different way. Matthew 12, as you all know, this passage, I'm going to read this to you. So his mother, his um, siblings were outside asking, we want to talk to Jesus. And he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For because whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and mother. Taking care of your own family member, anybody can do that. Everybody does it. But rejoicing, having a good fellowship with actual church member or saints, believers together, that's above and beyond what the world can do. That's why they think Christians are weird. Yeah. They don't understand why we're so happy to get together on Sunday while they're sleeping in. Think about it. Why would you do that? It's an exciting thing. And when you're going to picnic, right? Maybe not anymore because we're all grown up. When you're younger, when you know that you're going to picnic or some kind of uh, outing or vacation, you're excited about it. Right? No? <laughs> anyway, the same thing. So here, it's clear. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Please remember the Word of God. People who are acknowledging the divine authority of God. Saints. So the definition is right here, right? Whoever does the will of God. And third element is the thanksgiving offering. And fourth element, again, the fellowship as a worshiper with other worshipers. All right. We all need a break like this because in this world, we are going through everyday difficult situations at work, including myself, sometimes I feel like I want to quit my job, but I can't. Yeah, School, same thing. What am I doing in this school? You feel like that sometimes. A lot of difficult relationships, difficult situations happen. But because of that, it's more precious to have this relationship with other believers. Community of worship. Remember, I mean, whether it was biblical or not, uh, the content of those retreats, when you go on a retreat, go up to the mountain and have this fellowship with other um, friends, church members, you don't think about anything else. Those three days, it's just amazing. We always praise the Lord and then read the Bible, listen to the you know sermon, but still we're okay. And why not extend that experience and feeling every Sunday and better yet, every day in your life to, to have this great fellowship with other believers and glorify God through your life.